I'm Nikki Gilbert Daniels, writer, performer, producer, and advocate for women and girls in underserved communities. I'm most passionate about supporting women and girls of color because I believe that they deserve an equal opportunity, a purpose-driven and an empowered life, both personally and professionally. That's why I created my nonprofit organization, FromTheBottomUpFoundation.org, and initiatives like WORF Media, which is an acronym for Women in Reality, Film, TV, and Media. WORF aims to change the toxic, negative, destructive stereotypes and narratives that women of color face in the media. We believe that a national infrastructure that provides female content creators with platforms, resources, and opportunities to not just create, but to own and distribute content that not only entertains, but also uplifts, inspires, and empowers all women. Research has shown that the inclusion of women in media is essential to addressing racial and gender biases and inequities in employment, salaries, and most importantly, influence. My primary mission as an advocate is to improve the access that women and girls have to the tools, the resources, and the opportunities, the information that they need to thrive. We believe that the key to success begins with learning how to own your own intellectual properties, your stories, your songs, your creative ideas, the things that you come up with. These things have often been denied to us through various ways, such as gender pay gaps, racial and gender discrimination, misogyny, and flat out theft of our ideas, our creative intellectual properties. Owning our own content or intellectual properties is the key to helping provide our communities with generational wealth and generational wellness. According to the Journal of Gender, Social Policy, and Law, while individual black artists have without question benefited from the intellectual property system, the economic effects of IP deprivation on the black community have been devastating. Intellectual property today is perhaps the preeminent business asset. And analysts recognize that blacks and other minorities in a market economy cannot participate as equals unless they too can deploy the private power generated by ownership and control of those substantial assets. Our community deserves the opportunity to participate as equals, and we don't deserve to have our preeminent business assets stolen or infringed upon. In effort to bring awareness to issues impacting creatives and our ability to have meaningful participation in the properties that we create, I'm launching the Fight for Worth campaign. In launching this campaign, I'm not just fighting for myself. I'm fighting for any and every creator who has or will have to deal with the debilitating, heartbreaking, infuriating reality of having someone violate your creative, your intellectual, and your civil rights. My team and I thought long and hard before we decided to address this publicly. And while I will not comment on ongoing litigation, I wanted to share this campaign with my family, with my friends, with my supporters, with my business colleagues, in the spirit of transparency and clarity. As a 30-year veteran of the entertainment industry, I am clear that women of color are often viewed as difficult, emotional, or not tethered to reality. There have been numerous instances where I've had to keep my mouth shut and suck it up just for the sake of not losing my livelihood. There's no question about the contributions that African Americans have made to music, to film, to TV, to all media. We've long been undervalued. And contrary to the billions of dollars that we generate for large corporations for decades, this time I've decided to fight. I've decided to not only fight, but to document every step of the journey, good, bad, or indifferent. Because I believe <laughs> that this transparency is gonna educate, it's gonna inform, it's gonna inspire future generations of content creators to protect yourself to protect yourself and others from the pitfalls of this business. For me, this litigation is about advocating for the voiceless. It is about advocating for us because we deserve the right to protect the high value, preeminent business properties that we create. Those assets that we create for the benefit of not just ourselves, but our families and our communities and the overall wealth and wellness of underserved people. I would be remiss if I did not mention those of us in the industry who represent our community but do not spread the wealth and opportunities back into the community. If you are the only one in a room who represents your community, I challenge you. I challenge you to find ways to bring others who look like you into those rooms. We owe each other the loyalty and the honor 
of not being selfish, not being envious, not being a tool that is used to perpetuate the negative damaging stereotypes in our community. Those depictions that degrade, devalue our gifts and our talents. It is time for our leaders in the industry and the media to step up. It's time for us all to take accountability for others who look like us. It's time for us to have equitable partnerships and opportunities to truly build legacy for future generations. Worth Media is positioning itself to be proactive versus reactive. At Worth Media, we believe that content is both king and queen, and those who create it should be treated as such, and at the very least, treated as equals. We welcome all who believe in our mission to entertain, educate, inspire, and build generational wealth and wellness in our communities. And we're gonna do it together with you using the most powerful tool in the universe, the media. Please subscribe to worthmedia.com now for more details and information on the pending litigation. And please subscribe to follow my personal journey to fight for worth. Thank you for listening. What up, those sexy people? It's your girl, Nikki Gilbert Daniels, and thank y'all for joining me for this very special episode of Nights with Nikki. So as many of you are aware, your girl's been in the media and in the press. Um, thank you to the Black-owned press and media that has taken time to report on my case, my litigation against uh, Stars, Lionsgate, Katori Hall, and P-Valley. Um, tonight, I wanted to share something with you because, honestly, I was triggered. I was triggered by the announcement that Katori Hall was working on a docu-series because I honestly was hopeful that the docu-series would cover the journey of how P-Valley was, was really created, right? Knowing that information and having that evidence makes what my family has had to endure going into now four years. Would have made it much easier, but that is not what the docu-series is about. The docu-series allegedly, based on what Deadline and all those major headlines and outlets that are reporting about P-Valley what they're saying is that this is about discovering Memphis and the Delta, which is beautiful and amazing. And everybody in Memphis deserves the attention. But for me, it was a little triggering because again, if you're doing a docu-series, as far as I'm concerned, tell us what happened with P Valley. Tell us how the story came up. So with that being said, um, my team and I worked on a collection of conversations, a compilation of conversations between Katori, Nico, um, some executives at Lionsgate, various people, and these are words coming out of their mouths to describe what I've so desperately wanted to know, which is what are the origins of P-Valley? How did it start? W how did she come up with it? When did she come up with it? This is not about being petty. This is not about chasing clout. This is about my family's livelihood. This is about the home that we've lived in for 10 years. This is about the stress and the drama and the madness that we've had to endure. Um, and, and to hear that there is a docu-series that could explain a lot of this for us, but it is not addressing that. It's hard to process. So what I've learned through therapy and conversations with people that I love is that you have to release it. You have to talk about it. We see a lot of people in the press right now speaking truth to power. We see it from Denzel Washington. We see it from Taraji P. Henson. We see it from Suge Knight doing it from being incarcerated. We see it from Monique. We see it from so many people, Jaguar, we see it from so many people, comedians, actors, actresses, artists, creatives alike are using the opportunity to speak truth to power. And for my family and I, who started this journey to litigation in July of 2020, we're now going into July of 2024. I remember turning 50 thinking to myself, oh, this case will be settled, it'll be behind us. And I will be turning 54 and I'm praying for appeal. So I don't want to be long winded in an effort to not be long winded. Um, I wanted to share with you all, which is, you know, a little gives me a little anxiety because, again, you know, as much as it would seem like it would be cool to be able to share your story and just share your story authentically and just tell the truth. Um, I'm constantly under attack. I'm constantly under observation. I'm constantly, which is part of the reason why instead of going live with y'all tonight, I'm actually pre-recording this and airing it as a premiere because I don't want it to be disrupted. And somehow or another, my lives have lately been disrupted, but, uh, my lives and my life, <laughs> um, this is an important piece for y'all to watch because it isn't me 
saying what I think. It isn't me sharing with the audience my perspective on where this P Valley phenomenon came from. It is Katori, it is Nico, it is all the people who were there from day one. And this is just some of the stuff that I've had to read and absorb, you know, every time. And let me say this. I said I wasn't going to be long winded and I'd still have a little letter I got to read. But let me say this. Every time, most of the time, you see me responding in public to this P-Valley thing. It is because something has triggered me. I'm a human being. We are lo- we have we have been at risk of losing everything solely for the purpose or solely for the reason that we chose to stand up to what we knew was going to be an impossible fight without our faith, right? So this is me having the opportunity to release the trauma and the anxiety that I feel watching something that I created 20 years ago make so much revenue and create so much opportunity. What I believe created so much opportunity for people. It's hard to watch it. It's hard when you're, when you're going through hell and you losing things and finances are crazy because this company I feel is bullying me and my family. And then it's almost like they are boasting that they're doing this and doing that. The only thing I can do short of screaming and cussing and saying how I really feel is share with you some of what I've had to digest, some of what I've had to consume. And when I have to consume it, I have to release it. You know, when we eat, yeah, you got to take a shit. And this is me doing that. So let me read this and then I'm going to play this um, compilation of, of interviews and conversations from the mouths of the people involved in the project. And I hope that in the end, at the end of this, that if you see something like many of I've seen it, many people have seen it, that you say something, that you share it. Bottom line is, it does matter that this is shared far and wide. I have no idea whether I'm going to win my appeal. I have no idea why, why after all these years I wasn't able to go forward and go to court. But I'm going to read the letter. I mean, no disrespect to the judicial system at all. I do understand that. The judge's decisions are the judge's decisions and they are final and you deal with it unless you take it to the next level. And that's what we're doing. So as the as this thing is airing, um, I think our first brief will be filed this Friday. And I just want you all to pray for my family because, you know, we don't want you to judge and decide who's the who should be the winner in the case. What we're fighting for now is something different. What we're fighting for now is what I believe is my civil right, my First Amendment right. My right to petition, my freedom of speech, my ability to say this happened to me and the fact that I deserve, especially after being millions of dollars in debt. Well, let me read the letter because there I go talking about stuff that's in the letter. Anyway, over the course of this litigation, which is heading into four years and learning right before Christmas that our case was not going to be allowed to proceed to trial. I felt angry. I felt sad. I felt hopeless. My family was financially devastated. And quite honestly, like the entire process, I felt like the entire process limited or challenged my First Amendment rights to protest what I believe is injustice and to petition to be heard by both the public and the courts. After waiting many years and incurring financial debt over a million dollars, including an expert that my team hired, which was also a six plus figure expense that was thrown out of the court in spite of the third party experts opinion that P Valley used overwhelming numbers of substantial similarities. The kick in the gut is that all the money and the resources that the defendants have, they neglected to even hire an expert to explore their claims. To hear that my case was dismissed in summary judgment, a summary judgment that was ordered by the court for the defendants to file and later granted, as well as granting them the right to redact their sworn testimony, makes me feel bullied, hogtied, and discriminated against. I feel like if there's no chance of a case with as much merit, facts, and plausibility as mine, where access is uncontested, 
there will likely be no chance of any creative ever winning against a billion dollar corporation who quite honestly have been doing this for years. If we explore the case of Mr. Eric Monty, who 50 years ago created Good Times, The Jeffersons, Cooley High, just to name a few, to Sophia Stewart, who was dubbed the mother of the Matrix, to the women who claim to have written The New Girl, who had at least one of the same defendants listed in my case and the same judge, to the writers of Pirates of the Caribbean, who were also dismissed on summary judgment, but later, through the brilliant work of their Tony, who I've met, and he's dope, and I, I just say that, um, they were able to win their appeal and eventually settle their case. Whether it is those cases or the choreographer who also had his case dismissed by the same court and judge and recently won his appeal and settled his case, I am hoping and praying that this is a shift in the appeals court and I hope that that shift reaches my case. My family and I have sacrificed so much over the years because we know without a doubt that P Valley was in fact close enough to Soul Kittens Cabaret to at the very least allow a jury of our peers to decide based on the evidence. Fighting this corporate giant has been impossible without our faith, our family, and the support of each person who has gone to worthmedia.com and read the facts. We read about every salacious case that comes across the wire, and as a result of public outrage, many of these cases settle and the parties move on. I believe that the reason that the defendant, defendants in this case won't settle is because they know what we all know. A lone black woman taking on a multi-billion dollar Goliath will eventually lead to her destruction, her mental, emotional, and financial destruction. And that is indeed true. But what they never bank on with women is no matter how financially bankrupt we may become for standing up for ourselves, our spiritual wealth is immeasurable and we know that the real weakness is being morally bankrupt. We don't have the money to compete with billionaires. We don't have the resources to limit the audience reach of truth tellers. We don't lack the morals or the integrity that would use others to undermine people doing good work in underserved communities. All we have is our truth and the bravery and faith it takes to say it, do it, show it, and prove it every chance we're given. This industry has taken much from me, and over the years I've developed a serious love-hate relationship with it, not only for what it's done to me, for what it's done for all black creatives year after year after year. We've lost so much and so many, and each day we have more responsibility to those we love to speak truth to power. By power, I don't mean the corporations with all the money. By power, I mean the people. The people have always had the power. The people have the power to allow our truth to be heard in spite of our socioeconomic backgrounds, our genders, or our race. Truth has no face. Truth has no color. Truth has no gender. Truth just is, and this is my truth. So what you're about to see is a compilation of conversations that tell in what my opinion tells a very clear story. This is not me defaming or disrespecting anyone. This is me sharing the small percentage of the trauma I've had to live with. Unfortunately, you will probably never see the sworn testimony of the defendants because they were redacted. But what you will see here is what they said from their mouths. And if you watch and listen closely, you'll see how devastating it is to be denied the human and civil right to a fair trial. Many of you may ask, why now? The truth is, it's because I'm triggered by the recent announcement of P-Valley docuseries about Memphis, instead of one that will show the true story of how the show was originally created. My hope is that I win my appeal, but an even greater hope is that anyone who watched this shares my story, because my family has risked everything, including potential judgment for a million dollars in the defendant's legal fees, which is hardly ever granted. All of this simply because we wanted the right to copyright protection and the right to our First Amendment rights to freedom of speech and the right to petition. Please like, share, and subscribe to worthmedia.com. And please keep in mind that the views and opinions of the people in this compilation are all fair use. Thank you for watching. I want to 
to just jump right into it because some people haven't traveled down to the dirty south. Mm. And and shame on them. Shame on them. <laughs> shame on them. Shame on them. But did you know that this was going to be such a hit? Okay. I'm a little clairvoyant. <laughs> I I knew that there was a huge possibility that <laughs> if it got out into the world, a show about exotic dancers, but done in the way that um, it was with love and nuance and complication, that it would hit, and it would hit hard. Because I know our people. So I have this question for you. Oh, my God. Did you I'm nervous think... because oh, I did not know nervous. this hurt, this question is. What you going to do? What you going to say? I'm nervous. What are you going to say? Okay. <laughs> um, so... Did you think that when you got the first four pages of mm -hmm. the play Pussy Valley, mm -hmm. that it would lead to this moment? And let me explain to people. In 2009, Nine. Yeah. It was 2009, 2009, was it 2009? Dude, I don't care how long it takes me to get this story and these stories and these characters out into the world. I will do it. I don't care if it takes me 20 years. Because how long I did it take you? It took me 10. <laughs> 10. So talk to me about that because this was a play yeah. first. It was a play first. And so, yeah. and so talk to me about the process from how long it was a play, how long, how long, well, how long did it take you to write it? I have a lot of questions here. How long did it take you to write it? How long was it a play, and how long did it take you to get it from play to television? Just to um, uh, screen. According to federal copyright, Pussy Valley wasn't copywritten until 2017, and then again in 2018. So you're making a living as an actor in New York City, which is pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. And you start doing a play eventually called Pussy Valley. Yeah. Um, what was your preparation for this role? Uh, the preparation has been over a, a duration of time because I was originally in the production of the play when it was done back in Minneapolis and the full production went up, I think in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around there. Um, uh, but prior to that, it was a lot of readings and, and stage readings in New York and things like that. So my preparation has been over time. Well, and to be honest with you, like for anyone that's watching this, this version of Uncle Clifford and the world of P-Valley is vastly, vastly, vastly different from that play. For people who haven't seen Pussy Valley. Okay. Yeah. How would you describe Uncle Clifford? Uncle Clifford is such an amazing, amazing character. I'm very well aware that that is like, it's like lightning in a jar. It is. You know, there's always juxtaposition. Uncle Clifford is... Um... You you did him in a play, right? It started with her play. And so uh -huh. how was the process from the play? Where did you meet? Uh, this um, was a play? Oh, my yeah, God. Where, yeah, the play is actually called Pussy Valley. Right. I would have and where did you do that? In New York? shit on stage. Well, it started in New York, Lenny. Um, we started at the Lark Theater back mm. in 2009. Mm -hmm. they, they commissioned Katori for it, and they had the um, you know workshop series. So we did it for, I think the first time we did it was two weeks two weeks working on it um a play which was produced in 2015 at mixed blood theater in minneapolis and so um what a lot of people will come to know is that you read the first four pages like i hadn't even finished the play yet and then you um became you you originated the role of uncle clifford in the only production in the world at mixed blood theater in minneapolis yeah. there, that, that is the only production of the play that ever was done. And yeah. so my question, another question for you is having basically 10 years under your belt. No, not well, yeah, kind of 10 years under your belt in terms of being in this character. And then the producers, cause she was shopping to get produced and then the producers were like, oh, but you can't do this play with actors. You need dancers. And so, okay, so then it was paired up again with a group of dancers of of real like pole dancers that could read. You know, they were all <laughs> they auditioned and everything like that. <sighs> and then that's when people saw. So mm -hmm. it took me six years of researching. I mean, all the all these clubs interviewing all these different types of women who were dancers. Um, over forty women. 
it, that's how long it took me. And then it took me a, a couple of pole dancing classes. Because <laughs> so, I'm like, I want to know how hard, you know, pole dancing is. It's hard. It's hard. It's so hard. I almost <laughs> literally vomited after my first pole dancing class because I was on this pole that was on spinners. And I just like, I was like, oh, I got to go. I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, it, it, it was those things over the six-year-long journey of, the, of that part where, you know, all of that culminated into the play. And what was so crazy was that when I saw the play, I was overwhelmed. The play was overwhelming because it was too much going on. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I can't do this for two and a half hours. Ironically, both Pussy Valley and Soul Kittens Cabaret share the same running time. I need years. I need years for people to understand Uncle Clifford, to understand Mercedes, get to know Autumn Nye, you know, what's the backstory on Miss Mississippi. I'm like, I need, I need years. And so I very quickly pivoted. Uh, to creating a, a, a TV pitch because I was like, this could go on for, for seasons. Allegedly, the play went up in 2009. However, Katori only saw the play's potential in the 2015 version. If the characters were in fact written in 2009, why did it take 12 years to see story potential? And then that's when people saw... Oh, they, oh, the story is about that? that's a documentary. It Please is. Tell me that they documented it is. that. It Please is. tell me she's going to. I want to see that whole mm. process. Yeah. Please. Tell she me. got it. Katori has it. Tell I, her that. I don't know if she is going to ever release that because the intention but we did it there. Then when we did it with the dancers, people understood that. Oh, she's right. That you need to be able to act to tell this story. The dance supports the story, but this is a show that is literally about these marginalized it's people. It's just not about the damn It's not stripping. just about tits it's, and ass. It's just so, has so many levels of yeah. fucking awesome. It's layers to this. It's funny, because usually when you, you know, invite people to read, you got 10 pages. I had uh -huh. fun. Yeah. <laughs> I did have fun, because this, I was like, it's a lot, it's a lot. And so did Trying you- to put it all together. Katori was casting after only four pages. Did Nico influence or co-write that character? That moment, four pages till now, what does it feel like? Oh, uh, it feels like an out-of-body experience, to be honest. You went from that play to she hired you to do the show immediately, or did you? No. Come on now, you know this thing called really? Hollywood. <laughs> Baby, I had to shuck, buck, and dive for this. Really? Yes, yeah, so. I Why? That You're the, the that's perfect. your part. Mm. You're the, literally Uncle Clifford. I, I, I brought it to life. If Nico's involvement from page four helped bring the character to life, why would he have to shuck and buck for a role? That's your part. Mm. You're the literally Uncle Clifford. I, I, I brought it to life. You know, it's Katori's vision. Uh, she, I, the, her vision behind it was, you know, capturing a person that could be totally free of the societal strings of what masculinity and what femininity could be. Just if someone could just be totally free and accept themselves. So, boom, we had that. And then she had, I later found out some other influences that she told me that kind of influenced the character between her mother, her father, and her real Uncle Clifford. Mm. Um, and I've met all all three of them. Allegedly, Uncle Clifford was inspired by Katori's mother, father, and uncle. Uncle Clifford is nothing in real life like Uncle Clifford on TV, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not at all. And Uncle Clifford, you know, on the show uses she and her pronouns and is a non-binary person, a member of the LGBTQ community. Rarely does the world grab on to a character. Yeah. This country has grabbed on to Uncle Clifford. <laughs> it's so special. Yes. What do you think it is? Of what makes people grab onto her? Yes. I think it's the, uh, I think it's the audacity. You know, I think that the character is just so bold um, and free. And I think, um, I think that they also get, because the show is, Katori Hall is so specific in showing your angel and your demon, your mess and your beauty, you know. We made sure that um, every detail is a direct reflection of, of that dirty, dirty South, because, you know, that's where I'm from, and I wanted to represent it well and, and represent it authentically. So yeah. I, re I pivoted real quick, real quick, 
and decided that I was going to pitch it out. And uh, luckily, Stars, they bought that pitch. And we began a four-year part of the journey where I developed it. And it was crazy turning from a playwright into a creator slash showrunner slash executive producer. Uh, what, what was it like uh, uh, casting this show? So you have a lot of Broadway Black talent, like people that are known for their theater work. Yeah. So the chance to not really shine on television. How did that casting sort of uh, options come across? Like, so what? you know me, Drew. I'm always out in these streets. I'm trying to be and professional. Black people in the show. <laughs> I'm coming to see it. And that's why I was so mad. It was some shows that I didn't get to see because of this damn pandemic. But <laughs> I be like I said, I make sure I see anything by a Black theater artist. And if it has Black theater artists in it, I am there, front row. We've got to support one another. But it's also just, just good because you, you find these amazing gems. Victoria cast an actress from Soul Kittens Cabaret, Demetria McKinney played lead in Soul Kittens, also lead in The Mountaintop. Soul Kittens Cabaret was the first play listed on Demetrius' theater resume. I should say P Valley is based on your play that premiered in 2015, Pussy Valley. And in researching that play, you interviewed more than 40 women across the American South, visited the strip clubs where they dance. In doing those visits, in doing those interviews, what struck you the most? Their humanity just how similar they were to me, right? I remember going into the clubs and I was, a, I was a little scared. I was like, are these women really gonna talk to me about their lives? Are they really gonna let me in? And I think because instead of throwing dollars at them, I was throwing questions. Mm. And then the producers, cause she was shopping to get produced and then the producers were like, oh, but you can't do this play with actors. You need dancers. And so, okay, so then it was paired up again with a group of dancers, of, of real, like, pole dancers that could read. You know, they were all, <laughs> they auditioned. And so I cultivated these relationships quite quickly with numerous women. And in fact, um, one of my favorite moments was that I celebrated my 30th uh, birthday in the women's locker room, uh, popping bottles with the dancers at, at Sin City. In December of 2013, Nikki Gilbert traveled to L.A. to pitch Soul Kittens Cabaret and her dramatic spinoff, Curtains. My attorney at the time, Leroy Bobbitt, set up a meeting at Lionsgate. And what I pitched was a co-ownership deal. The producers of Soul Kittens Cabaret, my co-producers, had a, a, they also produced and put money and backing behind Tyler Perry for his first show. So they were also prepared to do a similar deal with me. And again, a part, a contingency of that deal was Nikki will help you finance these properties, but you have to go in and um, partner. These had co-ownership deals. The very people that I'm talking about that were prepared to do that with me with Lionsgate were the people that backed me financially for From the Bottom Up, which is a series that I produced with Queen Latifah and Shaquem over at Flavor Unit. Soul Kittens Cabaret was copyrighted in 2004 and again in 2006. I met with Lionsgate. Um, you know, I left him two copies of my Soul Kittens Cabaret script, the, the musical. I left him two copies of my DVD. I left him two copies of my pilot, which was called Curtains, which was a dramatic spinoff of my play. Federal copyright lists Nikki Gilbert as the claimant with a date of creation of 2004. Now, the head of the company, I gave him the pitch. You know, I, I mentioned, you know, who the characters were. He even went so far as to say, oh, Tata Burlesque, I love that name. He said, I usually read scripts personally. I'm like, oh, you actually read them? And actually in my research, I saw where he actually mentioned that he goes and he reads the scripts over the weekend with his family. So he told me he was going to go read the script over the weekend with his family. And then he was going to get back to me. Right. And I just knew that it was protected because not just because I was giving it to the head of the network, but because I was referred by an attorney um, in L.A. So I left all of that stuff with them and I didn't hear back with them from them. So I assumed that they just weren't interested, right? No beef, you know, I'm not thinking that anybody's gonna take my idea and, and run with it and it's gonna become P Valley. I'm just thinking they weren't interested. I pitched a lot of people that year and they weren't interested. But like I said, BET did take um, my, my or, sorry, license my show idea from the bottom up, which was a licensing deal, the same kind of deal that I pitched to 
uh, Lionsgate. And every element in P-Valley, beginning, middle, and end, is the exact same as not just Soul Kings Cabaret, the musical stage play, but also the scripted series, the pilot episode that I sent, that I left with Lionsgate. Well, you had something happen, I believe, that's a writer's worst nightmare, and that is a script of yours was stolen? Yeah, I had a script stolen. Um, it was, I have two scenarios that you can say the word stolen, but the one that really, I think, affected me deeply was I trusted people that wanted me to write, and I was 19. This was my first like hire for um, film, like a film script that I'm being hired to write. And I worked with people that I really trusted, and they didn't do the wrong thing, but they didn't protect me to make sure the wrong thing didn't happen, or even ask me questions to make sure I was thinking of it. And um, the film, they told me originally, they were like, well, this is not really where we want to go. We'll circle back, you know, maybe a year from now because we're going to go with another idea. And I was like, okay, no problem. I enjoyed the experience. I got to write a, a film script start to finish and just kind of waited. And then I saw the film. Um, it was uh, maybe about two or three years later. And it was a little different, but it was, it was like, that, okay, I wrote that line. You know, one of those moments. In December of 2013, Nikki, Katori, and Nico we're all in LA at the same time pursuing television endeavors. For I left New York, I was like, okay, moving, leaving theater behind for a moment, let me transition to on camera. And I was out here. And I remember waking up every morning and going to my pitch meetings. And some people would not even let me through the door to pitch the show. And, it, you know, the, this idea of exotic dancing and a story in, in, in that world was just considered too taboo. It, it, it felt like a cultural landmine. And but still, I was so determined. And luckily, I walked through the doors of stars and this really wonderful executive named Marta Fernandez, who's not there anymore. But she was the person that I ended up pitching my idea to. And she got it. And it's funny because not everybody know Marta, but Marta, her eyes don't light up in much. Like she real dry. <laughs> like you really got no face. <laughs> was she the last person that you would expect to get it? Not only was she the last person I expected to get it, she was literally the last person I pitched to. Marta and Katori have an interesting mutual connection. Tanya Sriracha, the showrunner for the Star's own show, Vita. It's likely that Tanya and Katori were familiar with each other if not friends. In 2011, they both received the Ruby Award. Tanya describes meeting Marta Fernandez. It appears Marta had reached out for Tanya initially and presented her with an opportunity. Sriracha assumed they were going to discuss possible employment as a writer on a star show. Instead, Fernandez pitched Sriracha some ideas. She asked her to pick the one which she was most connected to. Sriracha liked the idea of Por Vida, as it was then titled. In an article online, Tanya Sriracha was quoted, This was pitched to me by stars. The idea of a show about gentrification and millennial women. I do think it matters who was pitching this to me. Which is interesting, replied the interviewer, for a network to actively want to do that. That's what I said that day. Sriracha was quoted. Tanya was surprised the network was pitching her. Tanya worked on the pilot and came back two years later and was made creator and the showrunner. Because you said that this pitch has got to be really good. I'm sure they, the others were good as well. What was different about this pitch that you didn't do for the previous pitches? Well, I, I pretty much did the same thing for every pitch, but I think there's something about when you walk in the door and you know you've made a big mistake by being 20 minutes late. <laughs> and so then all the, all the adrenaline and all the nerves just go away because it's like, well, I'm already fucked up. So, <laughs> so let me be honest. And I just, I remember speaking from my heart to the point where I didn't even have to look at my, um, my pitch pages. It was like, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story as to why this story this show needs to be done, why I'm the person who needs to do it. Katori had no prior TV experience, which leads one to question, how did she convince Marta she was the person to do it? And Marta got that. 
Mm -hmm. and, and what was crazy, I was like, woo, I done jumped through that hoop of fire. Child, I done made it, I done made it. I was like, oh, whoa, 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 you got to jump through another hoop of fire. So I ended up having to repitch again after everyone in Hollywood had passed. So I actually knew everyone had passed before I had to pitch to the president of stars at the time, who was Chris Albrecht. Um, he's no longer there as well. Um, but I knew that literally that was my only chance because everybody else had said no by the time I walked through that door. So I basically, once again, it's, it's like, this is, it, this is now nothing. So everything that I have ever learned in my life, every stage that I have stood on, um, my ancestors was behind me too. They was like blowing the, the, the wind that was beneath my wings. Um, but most importantly, I remembered the faces of the women who I had interviewed. I remembered sitting backstage with them I remember going into their homes, meeting their sons, mm -hmm. meeting their daughters. That's what helped me, I think, pitch my heart out to the president. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of it, me and him were pitching each other story ideas about the wow. season. So it ended up weirdly becoming this pitch session that went into a work session. Katori says she and the network were pitching each other story ideas. To Fernandez was also pitching Tanya Sriracha story ideas and also made her showrunner. And that's when I walked out. I was like, oh, my God, I hope that I did OK. I hope I did OK. Oh my God. <laughs> and a few hours later, I got that call. Yeah, like, they're, they're a awesome. few hours later? Yeah. <laughs> wow. So did you have a moment of like Julie <laughs> Roberts and, and Pretty Woman and Richard Gere? Like, <laughs> big mistake. Big mistake. <laughs> December 19. 2013. Katori posted a photo from Los Angeles. She appears to be at a friend's note, the air mattress, she describes in one of her online posts. So I remember going out to LA and I remember I had to um, sleep uh, on the air mattress at my friend's house. Katori posted online, California Corrections. Writing is rewriting. Don't let nobody tell you different. A friend posted with the icons, hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil. Two years after pitching in Los Angeles, Katori reached out to Nico in 2015. She was putting on Pussy Valley for the first time. And then I got a call. It was like, okay, so we're going to be producing the whole show. So, you know, I want to know if you want to meet the director, blah, 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 blah. I met the director, Nataki Garrett, at the time. Um, and boom, we went to Mixed Blood Theater in Minnesota. And so we wow. did the show there. That was the first time that we had the full, full production. In the 2015 version, was there a casino plot? The play version only made three thousand dollars. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I should frame this check. Katori said the play only made three thousand dollars. Yet, less than one year after its 2015 premiere, Pussy Valley was picked up by Stars in the year of 2016. Stars has a very selective system of choosing a showrunner. The showrunner to us is the lens that we see a project through. We try to work in other modes, but that is our default setting. A clear idea rendered through that person's perspective is the, the beginnings of a show. We've got a, um, we call it an orientation process, mm -hmm. because um, when we talk to people um, from women in film, they said, you know, there's this thing called shadowing, but shadowing is kind of bullshit because people shadow all the time and they never get jobs. How were you going about choosing writers to, to come with you? What were you looking for in those folks? So I will say for that first room, because every, every room had a different kind of requirement, I'll be honest about that. So I think for that first room, because it was my first time, I was really looking for a lot of upper level people who, you know, they, they had done the whole TV rodeo multiple times before. I, I had done one show. I was a staff writer on one show, but that was it. 
And so I, I was just really out of practice in terms of thinking about stories in uh, an open-ended way. Yeah. What was super tricky was that it did take me time to figure out what the, the TV version was. So I actually had three writers running. Mm -hmm. Well, the showrunners got that in mind, you know, like, right. so we said, well, we're going to take a different approach. We're going to hire people for the, for the job. We're going to send them to the show. They're going to sit there for a couple of episodes. They're going to get familiar with the crew, the cast. They're going to see the rhythms of the show. And they're going to be oriented so that by the time their episode comes up, they'll be in a position for success. Liz Garcia was my, my co-showrunner for that, um, the, I will say the first two rooms. Was Liz Garcia a shadow showrunner for Katori Hall? This, this shit is so hard. It's so hard. The creative side is hard. The showrunning side is hard. You know, when you talk about the, the nervousness about it, there is a, a kind of nervousness and anxiety in the U.S. on the studio side, yep. if you don't have that person who's taking control, and when, what you're looking for is, I guess, this combination of experience and credibility, because when somebody has that, you know, everybody can be calm and just kind of sit back and go like, okay, I'm in the hands of a storyteller. Cool child, the stuff, you know, you have to deal with as a showrunner, um, it's, it can make you want to retire really early. I think directors don't want writers to be showrunners. I think the crew, just don't know who the hell you are, you know, why are you even here? Um, so I think you have to earn your credibility. And I think the hardest thing is toughing that out, actually. Neither Katori or Tanya had prior experience, yet Marta Fernandez made them showrunners. I'm curious, when was the last time you or, or perhaps your, your network or your studio partners felt sort of genuinely scared to tell a story? And maybe it was the, the larger story that you were telling with your shows, or maybe it was a scene, a line, a moment. Man, I feel like that's just the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely kind of been the, the, the story of, you know, Pea Valley, unfortunately. Like, it was, it was just even hard to get someone to say yes to even start developing it. And Marta got that. And that's when I walked out, I was like, oh my God, I hope that I did okay. I hope I did okay. Oh my God. <laughs> and a few hours later, I got that call. Yeah, they're, they're a few through. hours later? Yeah. <laughs> wow. So did you have a... Um, and I would say the whole enterprise, you know, kind of makes people, you know, clutch their pearls a little bit, you know, till this very day. And that's why, you know, people like you, people like Courtney, like, you know, finding very capable women who can then step up to that sense of responsibility um, and, you know, become the, you know, showrunner. Star CEO Jeff Hirsch had this to say regarding Pussy Valley. You know, giving Katori Hall a hundred million dollars to create a show as a first time African-American playwright behind the camera. People don't feel comfortable doing that. And we've shown that it can be ultimately successful and it's good for business. And we're hoping that the rest of the industry follows. You know, how does that backdrop influence you know, programming decisions? Are, are shows more likely to be picked up for additional seasons given you know, a potential likely so down in launching newer productions? So how, how do you balance that? So for us, there's really four core metrics that we look at from our data on the show, whether we bring it back and uh, let me take a step back. Having seasons two, three, four, and five are really important for the streaming service because that's where we see great subscriber growth. So we're really trying to make sure that we can get shows to that season five. Ghost is in season three, P Valley will be in season three. And so as we move shows into two, three, four, and five, that's where we see great subscriber growth as well as great retention. And so there's really four metrics we look at. You know, we look at the cost per thousand minute viewed, we look at subscriber growth or decay from episode one, we look at completion rate, and we look at all that, that those data. And we, we have a pretty good sense based on the data whether the show will grow in season two or it won't. And so the economic environment aside, we really have a core set of metrics that allow us to make decisions on whether we bring a show back or not. But the real value is when the show gets picked up and it's a hit. I mean, if you take a look at what Jeff has, P-Valley, it's a monster hit. And then the Power Universe, which is uh, you know, continuing to grow. Nikki Gilbert Daniels pitched a co-ownership deal which would net 25 to 50% profit. The producers of Soul Kittens Cabaret my co-producers had a, they also produced and
put money and backing behind Tyler Perry for his first show. So they were also prepared to do a similar deal with me. And again, a part, a contingency of that deal was Nikki will help you finance these properties, but you have to partner. These have co-ownership deals. We move fast. We also will, we're well capitalized. So if we want to, uh, partner up with a network show and, and, and put up half the money like we did on something or 25% or 50% of the money like we did on Ghost, which turned out to be a great uh, uh, transaction for us. And that's gonna be a very, very profitable show for us. So uh, we've got a lot of flexibility, both financially and also creatively. And we, you know, we are an arms dealer. Jeff only wants a certain number of short shows in a specific demo and everything else is the wild west. The very people that I'm talking about that were prepared to do that with me with Lionsgate were the people that backed me financially for From the Bottom Up, which is a series that I produced with Queen Latifah and Shaquem over at Flavor Unit. You know, giving Katori Hall $100 million to create a show as a first time African-American playwright behind the camera, people don't feel comfortable doing that. And we've shown that it can be ultimately successful and it's good for business. And we're hoping that the rest of the industry follows. Why again would you give a first time showrunner who has never had any experience $100 million and a person coming into your office who, although I have not done dramatic series for television, but I produced R&B Divas, I produced from, I've produced other shows, I've written other shows, right? The DVD where it may not be great, I directed it, it was my directorial debut. I have had more experience. The only thing that I can come up with and the reason why I wanna to go to court and the reason why it's so important to get in front of a judge and a jury is because I believe that the reason why they didn't want to do it with me is because I wanted ownership. I love the direct control, and I think that's the reason to be both a network and a studio. Mm -hmm. um, and I, because I enjoy like the ability to get what you want, when you want it, at the price that you want it, and being able to, you know, kind of hold the purse strings and either flow in resources when you think it's important or cut them off when you think that it's unwise. I had an interesting journey um just you know be very fully transparent where you know the the show was embraced by stars um but then in the midst of um a transition you know all my entire team that i started with who were like you know really championing the show they all left for a variety of reasons and so there was like this whole new guard coming in and so it felt a little bit like oh my god i gotta pitch my show over again <laughs> to the people who are not currently um, my partners. And even the most well-intentioned, um, you know, executives can sometimes, you know, make some rash decisions to the point where, you know, people were just like, we don't know if we really wanna step on this cultural landmine of having a show that centers the black female experience, but from, you know, a stripper's perspective, you know, is it, you know, walking in stereotype? We we don't want to perpetuate stereotypes. So Katori, you know, we're, we're just afraid to the point where, you know, the, the show was kind of canceled before it even aired. Um, there wasn't a second season in sight because there was this feeling of not wanting, you know, uh, a woman, actually a black woman standing so firmly in her, her sexuality and in her body and not being um, afraid of a white gaze or a black gaze, um, that can be very threatening. That's why I have often just kind of, you know, said F you to all of those kinds of pressures, this idea that you are responsible for making us look good. And it's like, no, nah, baby, I'm responsible for telling the truth. Um, so that's always been my guiding light. That's what helped me, I think, pitch my heart out to the president mm -hmm. and then by the end of it me and him were pitching each other story ideas about the wow. season so it ended up weirdly becoming this pitch session that went into a work session former star ceo chris albrecht had this to say about green lighting pussy valley Sentence. If I knew then what I know now, I would have. Ooh. If I knew then what I, if I knew then what I know now, I would have picked my partners more wisely. Mm. Okay. <laughs> We're just gonna let that. We're gonna let that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank 
you, Katori Hall. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is great. Uh, continue to stay safe. Um, you can still catch P Valley guys on Stars. And um, we look forward to season number two. Yes, and three and four and five. And three and four and five. That's right, because <laughs> you have a lot to tell. This idea that you are responsible for making us look good. And it's like, no, nah, baby, I'm responsible for telling the truth. Um, so that's always been my guiding light. I think it was a horrible experience, but I can't say I'm glad it happened, but a lot of goodness came out of it. It caused me to be so much more prudent and so much more watchful and wise, which is great for personal use, but then also being someone on the other end now, hiring writers and so forth, and even something I'm working on right now in pre-production, it's like, I wanna educate every young writer because it's something that no one's gonna, I can't say no one, but there, there aren't many people that are not going to want to use you for your gift, and that's a good thing, but you gotta make sure they're using you in a way that you're comfortable being used. So it's like, it's fine. Your gifts are here for, to be used and shown. So don't feel like, oh, they're using me, that's fine. But just put limits and, and boundaries on that, and that comes in with legal. If I knew then what I, if I knew then what I know now, I would have picked my partners more wisely. Mm. Okay. <laughs> We're just gonna let that. We're gonna let that. <laughs> to quote Katori Hall, who was quoted as saying, she wished she had chosen better partners. Your responsibility is to tell the truth. To be continued. Worth Media is positioning itself to be proactive versus reactive. At Worth Media, we believe that content is both king and queen, and those who create it should be treated as such, and at the very least, treated as equals. We welcome all who believe in our mission to entertain, educate, inspire, and build generational wealth and wellness in our communities, and we're gonna do it together with you using the most powerful tool in the universe, the media. Please subscribe to worthmedia.com now for more details and information on the pending litigation, and please subscribe to follow my personal journey to fight for worth. Thank you for listening.